So I want to start here. We're going to look at a couple main passages, Psalm 103 and Romans chapter 12 today. Um, but when I read verse 1 and 2 first, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, there's something that we've kind of repeated some. I think even there were, uh, somebody mentioned Thessalonians, you know, that it's the will of God that we give thanks. In other words, it's a command for us to give thanks to God. And that might be kind of a strange thing, like why, did, why is God always in his word, always commanding us that you have to give thanks, give thanks, be grateful, you know, what is this all about? And I was, I was just thinking of it in the time of worship, and it's, it's very similar to how we tell our children. They ask for something, we give it, and then as we're handing it to them, they're about to take it, we say, ah, ah, ah. say thank you, say thank you. You know, because we wanted them, them to recognize that they're receiving something. We wanted them to recognize that somebody else is in this world. It's not just them getting to get all the stuff that they want, but they have to think, wait a second, I, I have to say thank you because somebody else is doing something for me right now. And so it's a way to protect our hearts that we give thanks to God, that we recognize that all the blessings that we have are not something that just come, but they're something that are given by a gracious God. And so here, uh, David is telling himself, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's speaking to his soul and he's commanding his soul to bless the Lord. And he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In other words, there is a discipline that, that David is telling himself to have. It's a discipline to give thanks, to list, and to remember all the blessings that God has given him. And so it's a discipline in our life that we remember all the things that God has given because it's so easy for us to wake up in the morning and expect that the sun will rise and that the, the rain will come and that everything will be okay in our lives. But the reality is that we need to recognize and tell ourselves, wait a second, all these things God has done for me today. And we list it out and we give thanks to him and we remember these things and we list them out. It's a purposeful we have to be pers purpose purposeful in remembering all the different kinds of blessings that he gives us. In this way, it keeps us from bitterness, it keeps us from pride, it keeps us from despair, because we realize, wait a second, I can't be proud, this is something God has given to me. I can't be bitter, look at all that God has given me. Oh, I, I can't be in despair now, look at all the troubles I've gone through in the past and that God has always brought me through. And so as we give thanks and we list all the things and we remember them in our mind and we discipline ourselves to think on those things, we remember there is a good God that is graciously watching over us and that we can't be proud about it, we can't grow bitter in our hearts about the things we don't have, and we can't be in despair about the troubles that we're facing because God is always faithful. There's a verse I was thinking about again during the worship time. It says, I, I was young and now I'm old and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Now I'm getting older, I'm not as old as I could be yet, I could be a little bit older, but that's what I've seen. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, or their children begging bread. I've seen the righteous go through a lot of difficulties. I've seen the righteous face a lot of trials, a lot of heartache, but as they continue to stand for Christ, Whatever they've gone through, whatever has come against them from other people or the situations of life, in the end, they're always rejoicing. In the end, they're always praising God and saying, well, I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I stood with Christ and here I am and wow, what a blessing. And so in our lives, we need to recognize that the righteous are never forsaken. And we can do that by recognizing all the blessings that he, he's given. It comes out of his character. It's faithful like the sun rising every morning. His faithful character always provides those things. He just doesn't change. His mercies are new every morning. His grace is always sufficient. He's always there, faithful. And so we, whenever we're facing whatever we're facing, we need to remember these things. And he goes on and lists some of the things here in verse 3. Who forgives all your iniquities. Too many to count. Too many to count. Not before, the, not before I got saved, not before you got saved. There's too many to count after you got saved. All the list of things that you've done wrong, the wrong attitudes, the wrong mindsets, the wrong words, the wrong deeds that you've done since you've come to Christ. He is the one that has been there as a pangantara, as a, an advocate at the right hand of God. They're sitting there making intercession for us. That when we fall, we come back to him and we receive mercy, we receive grace, we receive forgiveness. He forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. We say, but I feel sick today. 
Yeah, but you felt sick three years ago and you thought it was gonna be worse than it was and God helped you and God got you through it and God blessed you. Who redeems your life from the pit. My friend, if you're in Christ today, you're not on the way to the pit. You're on the way to the kingdom of God. If you're in Christ today and you're following him and you're holding on to him and clinging to him, he has redeemed you from the pit and he is leading you to everlasting life who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. I mean, this is our crown. We walk around and, you know, again, going back to the righteous, never being forsaken, whatever difficulties. I think of the people in my life that I know very well, that I've walked through many battles with, that have, we've, we've fought wars together, and we've stood together against all kinds of assaults of the enemy and false brethren and, and wicked men, and we've done this, and I see them, and I see their, their hearts just still filled with joy at the loving kindness of God, that they, that they get to the end of every trial, and they're just grateful. They're just grateful. The world might look and say, well, they got less money now. They've got less prestige now. They've got less power now. They've got less reputation now. But they sit there crowned with the loving kindness and the mercy of God and completely satisfied and content in him. And so God crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. This is food and everything else. Everything else that he gives us in our life. The Bible says that he, uh, he uh, how, what does it say, Timothy? It says that he provides us richly all things to enjoy. That God created a world that didn't just have apples, but it had apples and oranges and durian and, and, and manga and everything else. That it's different colors, it's different shapes, different sweetness, different bitterness, all these different things. And not only in the fruit kingdom, but in every area of life that he's provided all things richly for us to enjoy that he has satisfied us with good things, not only natural things, but spiritual things in every way, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, so that at the end of the life, you know, it's, it's common for men at the end of their life to become bitter, grumpy old men and gossipy old women. That's just the natural course of things as they face the difficulties of life, but those that walk with Christ, those that continue to walk with Christ through all the issues of life and see his goodness throughout life, they end with a, a, a youth that's renewed like eagles, that they're still rejoicing, that they're on their deathbed, still laughing, giving thanks, still filled with joy, even though their body's racked with pain. They have hope, they have joy because of the goodness of God. And this is what we're going through now. If you're walking with Christ now, and you keep walking with Christ, that's your end. That's your end. You're gonna at some point be on your deathbed or be smacked by a car or whatever it's gonna be. This is the facts. It's gonna be. But if you keep walking with Christ, that last moment is gonna be a moment of hope. It's gonna be a moment of life. It's gonna be a moment of peace, of joy, of being able to look back. And you know, they, they say that when somebody dies that their whole life flashes before them. But for a believer, when that whole life flashes before us, it's just a, a pouring out of gratitude. Thank you, Lord through everything that you brought me through, everything that I've gone through. And so this is something that we need to be practicing now, that we tell ourselves, we tell our soul, bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. This is how we keep out of pride, out of bitterness, out of despair. You know, I was thinking about things that, I mean, daily that kind of overwhelm me, that I am grateful for, uh, that I, I am almost a little bit embarrassed about how grateful and blessed I'm at. And one of those is my kids. You know, my, my, my kids, uh, they shock and amaze me. And it's not just that I love them. It's not just that I like them. It's not even just that I'm proud of them, but that I have a deep respect for them, that I want to be more like them, that they impress me, and that I sometimes go to my room thinking, ah, I wish I could be more like Omid or more like Bebet or more like Iman. Like, oh Lord, help me to be more like them in this area, in this way. And that, and that I, I, I'm just overwhelmed. Like, wow, oh, how are my kids better than me? I just don't get it, but it just is. And, and I'm grateful for it. And it's something that I can strive for. It's something that I can respect and just be so filled with amazement, filled with joy. Just, uh, you know, I've often said it when I go to somewhere without my kids, without my wife, I feel like I leave without my preaching credentials. 
you know, because because whether what, whether I'm a good guy or not, they make me look good. Uh, they, they make me look like I'm something, you know. It's like, well, he must be a godly man. Look at his children. Look at his wife, you know. And so whether that's true or not, it, it, it's, at least they make me look good. And so they are my, my preaching credentials. It's not from some organization or from some church or from Sinoda, but it's, it's from, from them. And I'm, so I'm so grateful uh, to have them in my life. Uh, and then, of course, my wife. My wife. And I'll see... Whenever, you know, you guys don't know the whole story of me chasing her, but I definitely just had to chase her. I mean, it was, it was a long process, difficult process, a lot of weeping in that process, a lot of confusion in that process. But I, I remember distinctly there were many times where, you know, it was, it was kind of on a razor's edge of whether God was going to work it out or not and just thinking, Lord, you know, if you were to grant this, I should serve you for the rest of my life without complaint if you never ever do any other blessing for me that you would give me her as my wife. And it has been such a blessing, and I have no regrets about that. Now, you know, when I saw her, you know, she's this soft-spoken, very gentle, very kind individual, and I thought, that's just what I need. That's just, that's just what I need. Good, submissive woman, that will, you know, help me, you know, serve God. She's not actually like that totally. And thank God she's not, because I would have destroyed her, destroyed myself, I would have destroyed everything, you know. And so thank, thankfully, she is not only kind and gentle, but she is also rock solid. She is also willing to speak her mind. And so that is such a blessing to me. Otherwise, I definitely would have hurt a lot more people along the way in my leadership. I would have, you know, hurt myself a lot more. I would have hurt my kids a lot more. And so uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for Esther. It's a blessing to have uh, a family like this. And so in our lives, we need to recognize what God has given us, what God has put into our lives. Now, there's a prerequisite for being grateful. There's a prerequisite for being grateful. And then that's we must realize that we are unworthy of any blessing. That we are unworthy. Now, this is not a Joel Osteen message. We are unworthy of any blessing. We are worthy of some things. We are worthy of damnation. We are worthy to be cursed. We are worthy to be judged by God and cast aside into outer darkness forever. We are worthy of that. But self-righteousness is never grateful. Self-righteousness looks around and says, I deserve that. I deserve whatever I got, I deserved it. I deserved it because I'm trying hard, because I'm doing well, because I've changed, because I'm better than that guy, because I've got this gifting, and so I deserved it. But gratitude is never that way. Gratitude is always recognizing our unworthiness. If we turn over to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 15, Paul says this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of, who I'm, of whom I am the worst. And I think I've said it before from here, but when we look and we see other people, we see their faults, their sins, their arrogance, their whatever they've got, we can kind of get a glimpse of it. But it's only from the outside. But if we are walking with integrity before God, if we are walking with honest hearts before God, we see something much deeper working within ourselves. We see the weaknesses much clearer than we can see it in other people because we can only see on the outside maybe their tone of voice or maybe the words they used or maybe whatever it is that we see on the outside. But when we see in our heart, we see it working all the time. We see it always pulling us towards being critical or being bitter or being selfish or being lustful or being proud or whatever it is that it draws us to. We see that battle going on inside at all times. To where Paul, he can say that before Christ, he was the worst of sinners. He was the, he was the, the worst of all that had ever existed, that he had persecuted the church, that he was against God that he was a blasphemer, he was arrogant, all these things, and he recognized that, and that's why he could give thanks. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me first Jesus might show all the patience as an example to those who to believe in him for eternal life. 
that he could, because he recognized his unworthiness, he didn't do something to get saved, he didn't do something to be chosen, he didn't do something to be forgiven, it was because of the kindness of Christ that he was able to, to bow his heart and say, oh, this is the kindness of God, and I pray that everyone would see it, that it would be an example to all that God can forgive the worst of the worst. If we turn over to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Ephesians chapter 3, start in verse 7. Of this I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, to the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach the Gentiles the incomprehensible riches of Christ. So here, as a believer, he says he's the least of all saints. I mean, is he just kind of being uh, overly modest? Oh, yeah, you know, kind of like in Manado, everybody says, oh, Saya hanya hamba Tuhan. What does hamba Tuhan mean? It means I'm in pelayanan and I'm the best. So is he just saying, oh, I'm just, I'm it's only a hamba. I'm only a hamba. I'm the, I'm the least of all the saints. Or is it more likely that by the Spirit of God and in true honesty and integrity, he was speaking what he thinks about himself? That, yes, I have these giftings, Yes, I'm, I, I'm striving because of the grace that's within me to, to live for Christ, but in reality, I'm the least. I look around at all the saints, and I see like they're making better progress than me. I look at, around at all the saints, and I think like they have a more pure heart than I do. I look around at all the saints, and I see all their weaknesses, and yet I see more weakness in myself than I see in those around me. This is the only way. It's the prerequisite for having gratitude towards God, that if we recognize the weakness in ourselves. We recognize the, the failures in our own heart, our own life, our own attitudes. We see our weaknesses. It's in that place that we can recognize that all of this is God's grace in my life. All of this, every little thing, every tiny thing that I get, every meal that I have, that even though it's not the best meal, it's like, that's good enough. That's like a super grace from God. Why would he give me food? Why would he provide food and sustenance for me? But if we think, oh, yeah, I mean, because I'm, I'm a child of God, and because of that, then I'm going to get it. And, you know, and besides, I'm living for Jesus. And, and so that's why, you know, I get the, bless, the blessings are here and there. No, 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 no. It's because of his grace. It's because of his kindness. But we have to recognize how low we really are, what we're really worthy of. We truly are worthy of death. Not just before we were saved, but as believers. As believers, in our, in our weakest moments, we're worthy of being under his wrath, but instead we're under his grace, under his gracious discipline that continues to work in our lives so that we can continue to go forward in him. In him. So what do you believe you deserve in life? What do you believe you deserve? Happy marriage, good family, well-paying job, a job at all, I mean, good food, a house, a place to live, friends, do you believe you deserve those things? Do you believe you deserve those things? And that really answers a lot. If we can ask, what do I think I deserve? We all deserve death. We're all the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, you know, one of the thieves was cursing Jesus, and the, and the, man, the other thief rebuked him and said, why, why are you doing this? He's done nothing. He's innocent. We deserve what we're getting. But he doesn't deserve it. And that's who we all are. We're sitting on the cross next to Jesus, just looking to him and hoping for mercy. Looking to him and saying, Lord, please remember me. There's no reason you should. There's nothing I have to offer you to say, look, I'm gonna do this for you. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the Apostle Paul now. I'm gonna go start serving you and bring many people. I'm not gonna, I don't have anything to offer you. I'm just coming to you and asking you for mercy. I deserve nothing but death. But I expect, because of your kindness, because of your grace, I expect nothing but loving kindness and mercy. And we look to him and we trust in him. We're all the thief on the cross. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Now, he says this, I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. In other words, from Romans chapter 1, particularly through Romans chapter 8, but also in the, the following chapters 9 through 11, he's been speaking about the grace and the goodness of God. He's been speaking, particularly if you flip back to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6 through 8. While we were yet weak, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He's reviewing back and saying, look, in view of all the merciful and gracious acts of God that we've been talking about in this book, in view of that, with that in mind, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. But throughout, from, Gen from Romans 1 to Romans 11, he hasn't been talking about the prosperity that some say were promised in this life. He hasn't been talking about uh, all the health and wealth that some say were promised. He's been focused on one thing, that God gave his son for us. Verse 6, while we were yet weak, in due time Christ died for the righteous. No, for the ungodly. What is ungodly? Unrighteous means you're, you're, you're wicked towards others. You do all these kind of bad things. Ungodly means you forget God, you forsake God, you hate God, you don't want anything to do with him. Christ died for those people, for the ungodly. That's us. Rarely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In view of the mercy of God, present your lives as a living sacrifice. In view of the cross of Jesus Christ, in view of of God so loving the wicked world that he gave his only begotten son, present your lives as a living sacrifice. In other words, the cross is the primary blessing. It's the primary thing that we should be filled with gratitude that God gave his son, that Christ gave his life, and he gave it for us, the ungodly. We need to recognize that that is above all other blessings. It's above, it's above me receiving Esther as a wife, or my children, or health, or whatever God has given me and whatever God has given you. The one thing that shines above everything else is that cross, Jesus Christ going and giving his life for us. And if we keep our eyes on that cross, it becomes very difficult for us to become frustrated with life. It becomes very difficult for us to become bitter and all kinds of messed up in our mind because that was given to us. That was given for us, not because we're worthy, because he is good. And we keep our eyes on that. There was a, I wanted to tell kind of a, a story. I was, it was, I had just, I had planned to go to China. I, I went on a trip to China. I had visited there and I ended up staying longer. I ended up staying in, in China for three months. After I went on a one month mission trip, I stayed longer to take Bibles over into China. This was back in 1996. No, 95 maybe, I think. Yeah, 95. And so as I, I, I was going back and forth, and while I was there, you know, I, I felt like God called me to go to China. So I came back, and I didn't take any more mission trip. I just focused on finishing up college as quick as I could. And I was like, okay, i got to finish college so that I can go be a teacher in China so that I can preach the gospel there, you know, because there was open doors to be able to teach English. And, and as I, I was, you know, seeking that, I was working, I was doing, you know, Christmas breaks and summer breaks, I would just do college. And it went, it was the, it was the day I went to go, to go register for my last semester. And it just hit me. I was like, wait a second, after this semester, I'm free to go. I'm like, I can... I could get on a plane. I could move to China. I could go, go share the gospel there. And I remember that whole day, that whole day I didn't want to uh, ask God directly. I didn't want to ask him. I was just like waiting. I was at my busyness of my day, like trying to get around and get everything scheduled. And I was like, I was like at the end of the day, I'm going to go ask him, like if he will let me go. And... Uh, and so the day got over, and I went out, and I was staying in an apartment complex near my old Bible school, and I, I went out to this track that I would often go out, and I would, I would often go there to pray. And I just knew, like, so as I, I, just, I just started to ask directly, Lord, 
Can I go? I mean, before I even asked, just the presence of God came, and the Lord said yes. And I got so angry. I got so, God, you are not right. I said, you died for us. That was wrong. You give me everything that I want. You are wrong. This is wrong. This is bad. You're wrong. I was genuinely angry with God. And there's a phrase we have in Chinese, which is buhao isa. Buhao isa is like, when somebody does something really good for you, say buhao isa, it means like, I'm so embarrassed, I'm, I'm ashamed to receive it. And that's what I felt at that moment was buhao isa. It means not good feeling, actually, and not good meaning. And so I, I, I felt as I was, I was upset with God, as like, because there's nothing I can do. Nothing I can do to repay you. There's nothing I can do to give back to you. There's, there's nothing I have to offer you. Everything is just one-sided. You're just giving everything. And you going to the cross for us, that's wrong. You dying for me, that's wrong. Yeah, God is wrong. God is wrong. He, his love in giving his son for ungodly people is too much in, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, maybe you say, labai. It's too much, too extreme. It's over, it's over, over the top. It's too far because it leaves us in a place that all we are filled with is this kind of a burden of gratitude. That it's just like, it's hard to, to get rid of it. It's just like, we got to keep praising, keep thanking, keep mentioning all the things that he does. And it still seems like there's still so much more to give thanks for. But I've discovered over, over the years that there is something that God gives us to help us with that to actually give us a way to, to give something, even though that, 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 that well of his blessing is still unending and it's still such a burden, but he gives us a way to be able to, to kind of relieve it in some way. And it's in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And so even this he thinks about. Even... That burden that we feel of the gratitude, even that he, he thinks about and prepares for. In Colossians chapter 1, uh, let's see here, in, start in verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and are not moved from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Like, like amazing. What is this, what's Paul saying here? I mean, is he a Roman Catholic here? Is he saying like, uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta do something extra. The cross is not enough. Something that is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. So what is it here that was lacking? And what is it that Paul is saying that I am, I am rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake? Here he's saying that, look, Jesus, what he did on the cross is enough for the salvation of anyone who will believe. Anybody will turn to him and find life. But they have to hear the message. They have to hear the message. And Jesus died to save us, but we are given the blessing to suffer and to die so that other people can hear the message. That Jesus gives us a blessing that we can share in the fellowship of his sufferings. It's something that we can say, okay, Lord, I can't repay you, but I can walk with you in the midst of your suffering. I can, the same way that you gave for me, I can give for others. I can lay my life down so that others can hear the gospel, whether it be our family around us and that they don't like us and they're always wondering why we're talking about Jesus or whether it's the ends of the earth, whatever it is that we are, are giving ourselves so that they can hear a clear presentation of the gospel and that they can know Christ and whatever suffering we have to go in through that, that's our joy and our crown that we get to suffer with Christ that we get to somehow say, okay, I am grateful, and I do thank you with all the, the praise of my lips, but I want to give you something that cost me something. Just like David said, whenever they said, oh, look, we'll give you the place, we'll give you all the sacrifices you need, and he says, no, I won't offer to God anything that costs me nothing. And so the Lord has given us the blessing, even the added blessing, that we can suffer with him. 
And if we have a heart that's filled with gratitude, when we go through suffering because we're confessing Christ, we go through suffering because we're seeking to do the will of Christ in our lives, when we go through suffering for him, it will not be something that we complain and get bitter about, but it was something that we rejoice to fellowship with him in his sufferings because it's a way that we can walk with him. It's a way that we can give to him. We don't whine, but we rejoice. The thief on the cross was surely grateful and at peace, though everything was bad. All the blessings of life can go. Family can fall apart. Health can fall apart. Everything can fall apart. But if we have Jesus, if we're still there looking at him, listening to him to say, today you will be with me in paradise, like the thief on the cross, where we don't have anything to look forward to, there's nothing hopeful in our future in this world, but that we're still looking at Christ and saying, he gave his life for me and he has promised me eternal life with him. This is the blessing. This is everything. And so even when we're going through suffering, even when everything falls apart, we look to Christ and still be grateful. We're not soured in our heart. We're not bitter in our heart, but that we look to Christ and say, it's enough. Christ is enough. Christ on the cross is enough. And we rejoice with him and we will rejoice with forever. Now the response that we should have if we go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, in view of the cross of Christ, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's gonna cost us something. But holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. The thief on the cross would have gladly served and followed Christ. If he would have come down from the cross and he would have walked with Jesus, he would have gladly served him. He didn't have that opportunity, but we do. It's our chance, it's our opportunity that we can offer our lives as a living sacrifice to Christ, that we can serve him. This is our reasonable service. You know, we have Monado English service, but actually this is not the service. Everybody has kabaktian and ibada. That's not actually the thing. That's not actually ibadah. That's why people go to church and they, they go to church and they, okay, we finished our service and now we've served God. No, we haven't served God. We're here to be equipped to serve God. We're here to be trained. We're here to be challenged. We're here to be disciplined so that we can serve God. Our reasonable service is that we offer our lives as a living sacrifice day in, day out. We deny ourselves, we take up our cross and daily we follow him. That's how we are able to serve. That's our response to the kindness of God. That's, that's what that, desire, that burden in our heart that, that, that is filled with gratitude towards God and a little bit of feeling of buhau isa and overwhelmed with that burden as we feel that. Our response is not just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But it's our lives being given as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. And it says, it goes on and says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, this is not the good and acceptable and perfect will of God like it's stages. No, the will, the will of God is good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. It's something wonderful to follow Christ, his commands, read his commands and say, this is good. This is acceptable. This is perfect. His commands, his ways are perfect. They're like re refined, that like gold refined seven times in the fire. His, his law, his commands are wonderful. His ways are wonderful. And that we seek to know those ways. And that we do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we don't just get sucked back into worldly ways and thinking that serving God is a, is a way to get wealthy or serving God is a way to get happy or healthy or whatever it is. But no, serving God is a response to the kindness and the grace of God that he's given in his son. It's a response to all the overwhelming blessings that he's poured into our lives, though we are unworthy to the core. And that we are to seek to understand his will more and more day in, day, day in and day out. Let his mind, the mind of Christ, be planted in us. That we would know the will of God and be able to walk according to it. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5, if we go to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews 5 verse 14. It says, but solid food belongs to those who are mature. 
So the spiritually mature, those that are, are solid, those that are grounded, those that are walking with Christ, for those who, who through practice have their powers of discernment that are trained to distinguish good from evil, that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can come to know the good and pleasing and perfect will of God, that we do this by practice day in and day out. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice. It's been said before that a living sacrifice is harder to deal with than a dead sacrifice. And so a living sacrifice, we have to continually offer it to God. It's, this, is the, this is why we get to serve God day and night, night and day, every moment. Every moment that we have, we're giving it back to God. We're offering it to God. And we're doing this as a response because of his kindness and of his grace to us. If we turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. There's something amazing about this offering that we get to give to God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. No, not, oh, chapter 2, yeah. See, if you catch it as we read it here in verse 5, it says, uh, you also as living stones, just like living sacrifices, living stones, easy to move if they can walk away, are being built up into a spiritual house as a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, these sacrifices that we offer, it's, it's kind of like, a, you know, like um, how we serve Christ is like whenever your kid is like four years old, draws this beautiful picture of a horse for you, you're so proud of him. You hang it on the refrigerator. You know, he's so proud of what he's done. Like he drew this wonderful picture. It's got the meadow in the background. It's got the horse just, just galloping along the way. It's just like so beautiful. And you hang it on the refrigerator and people walk by and say, is that a, is that a dog? Why does it only have three legs? What's in the background? Did it, did it fall into a pit? You know, whatever it is, they look at it. Nobody can recognize it. Nobody can appreciate it. Nobody can see anything good in it. And that's, that's how we serve God. That's how we serve God. That's our living sacrifice. Our living sacrifice is like that. Is that we're drawing this picture that nobody can recognize except for God alone. In our minds, it, wow, it's like a galloping horse, you know. But in everybody else, they, they see the reality. You know, Esther knows me. My kids know me. I might be a scalloping horse, but they know, okay, yeah, yeah that's, that's daddy. Yeah, that's him. But God, because he looks at us and it says, it says spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Because Christ has made the perfect sacrifice on our behalf, our imperfect sacrifices are acceptable to God. Because we do them through him and with him and in him, that's why it's pleasing to God. Not because we did it with all of our might or we did it better than the next guy or, or we had a lot of success that everybody can see, but it was because we were doing it in love for Jesus Christ that the Father looked at it and said, that, I'm hanging that on the refrigerator. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. That's acceptable to me. And this is our life. This is how we serve Christ, is we walk with him in honesty, continue to be transformed, renewed, disciplined by him, so that we can know his will, delight in it, and walk in it. So we'll close here with in Luke chapter 17. Because our, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I, I know that uh, Pastor Hiskia has his, you know, studio. Now it's his living room. But, but he has the studio, and, you know, he had it all put up all nice, and he had the, the map in the back, and, you know, if you've seen any of his videos, you know, the lighting's good, everything. He, like, all organized it really well, and it's got at least some soundproofing in it, you know, so the echo's not bad, all this kind of stuff. But, but I can imagine whenever he was setting it up, you know, that King Lee was there wanting to help. And, of course, it's going to take a lot longer if King Lee helps. There's going to be some problems if King Lee helps. But he's like, okay, yeah, come help me, you know. And sometimes that's how we're like, you know, Oh, Jesus, can I help you? And he's like, sure. 
come help. You know, I'll try to fix up all your messes along the way to this thing when it gets done is actually something, something worthy of me, but, but come on, you can, you can help. You know, and this is, this is us serving God. This is us responding in gratitude to the grace of God and responding to the cross. It's us, like Kingly, helping to set up that room or to fix the car or to paint the house or to do whatever that needs to be done, sitting there, doing it, and the Father just welcoming it and, and wanting to do it with the Son. So we look here in Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 7. It says, which of you having a servant, plowing or herding sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come now, sit down for dinner? Will he not rather say to him, prepare my supper and dress yourself and serve me until I eat and drink? And afterward you will eat and drink. Does he then thank the servant because he did what was commanded? I think not. So you also, when you have done everything commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. And this is still where we're at. We're still at the place of being unprofitable, unworthy servants. And what we do is only a benefit to others and only to glory to God because it is made acceptable through Jesus Christ, his beautiful sacrifice. And it's a blessing that's given to us that we can serve God, that we can serve God. Like the worst of the worst. You say, well, we're not the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst is the Tekabe. No, we're the worst of the worst. This world is the worst of the worst, and we're part of it. But he lets us join in, and he somehow brings glory to himself through our lives. And he gives us this grace to be able to serve him and to suffer with him, and that's added on to all the other blessings that he's already given to us so that we can fellowship with him in his suffering. So I encourage all of us to recognize who we are, recognize that we are nothing and we can really do nothing for God. But he's done everything for us, and because of that, it should be our desire that we respond to him, desire to seek him and to serve him and to know him, rejoice even in suffering. And if he gives us nothing else than the cross of Christ, that we don't have bitterness, but we have joy and peace, full of, of glory inside of our heart, knowing that we have him, and that is enough. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness that you have richly blessed us with all things to enjoy. And most of all, you've richly blessed us with your kingdom and with your son who is the king over that kingdom. We thank you that you've shared yourself with us, that you've given yourself to us, that you walk with us and that you let us walk with you, Lord, even in your work, even in our families, that we can be lights to those around us, our friends, our coworkers, Lord, you let us be lights, Lord God, when we really have no light in ourselves. It's all from you. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be truly filled with gratitude, that we would truly look to you. We would not be filled with bitterness or with pride or with complaining or with any sort of thing, Lord God, but we would be filled only with gratitude towards our Savior that we would, like I said many years ago, that I, we would all say, you are wrong. You are wrong. And we would feel the weight and the burden of all your kindness that crown of loving kindness and mercy that you put on our head is so heavy that we can't even bear it. But we are so grateful for it. And we want to serve you with our lives. Though they are imperfect, we trust in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ to make it acceptable to you. Help us, Lord, to walk with you out of a heart filled with gratitude as we look to the cross of Christ and rejoice in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.